Good morning. My name is Amy Ranger. I'm the director of programs of the California School Based Health Alliance, and I'm really, really delighted to be here with Dr. Aisha Mays. She is one of the, um, and I'm just making sure we're recording also, yep. Yeah. Um, she's one of my professional heroes. I had a chance to work with her briefly at La Clinica, but I've also followed her career in many paths and um, in many ways over the years. She has done amazing things and has amazing things to tell us about how to bring services to young people in a way that is most empowering to them. So I'm really excited for this hour. Um, some really quick housekeeping. We will do some polling during the session. So hopefully you can see that feature on Hobolo. Um, you can submit chat or Q&A throughout the entire thing. And um, I will repeat those back to Dr. May so she will answer questions as we go along. Um, and okay, we are live and we're good. Um, and uh, we will be sharing slides and the recordings after the conference. And there's been lots of questions about that. It takes about 24 hours to get the recordings up onto the conference platform, but they will be there. And, um, and um, they'll be there through the end of November, I believe, but then you will still be able to access all the slides and all the materials on our CSHA website. So, um, you know, don't feel like you have to frantically write things down. Anything you want to see again, you can see again. Any slides you want to access, you can. Um, and then last of all, we do do an evaluation every day and it gets sent to you via email. So please fill that out at the end of the day. And with that, thank you so much, Dr. Mays. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. And hello, everyone. And thank you all for, for being here and for being in conversation uh, about how to support young people um, just throughout in their daily lives and school-based health and in our, our youth clinics. Uh, and I'm really excited to uh, have this discussion today talking about sort of centering re reproductive justice for adolescents. Um, and, uh, and would lo also love to hear you all's thoughts and feedback on um, how you might be doing this in your own practices or having these conversations. Um, I'm not able to see the chat, but again, like Amy said, that she will, she'll be helping to monitor the chat and helping me with that. Um, so please, um, we, I'd love for this to be an interactive discussion and as, as questions come up, please let us know. So I'm the Director of Adolescent and School-Based Services at Roots Community Health Center. Um, I'm the Medical Director of our Dream Youth Clinics in the Dreamcatcher Youth Shelter and the Covenant House Youth Shelters in Oakland. And I'm also a volunteer clinical faculty in the UCSF Department of Family, Med Family and Community Medicine. I have no disclosures um, and, um, uh, for this talk. So um, today what we're gonna be sort of talking about is um, really talking about the principles of reproductive justice and the history of reproductive justice, where the RJ movement even came from. Um, we'll talk about the importance of uh, centering reproductive justice principles when providing adolescent medicine and how, um, how things have shifted and how we're pivoting to sort of inc incorporate that. And then we will also go over some sort of tangible items, just um, incorporating reproductive justice standards and principles into your practice. We will also talk about the tension that, um, that uh, we may hold and uh, as we are um, incorporating reproductive, we're talking about reproductive justice with adolescents and incorporating reproductive justice principles, how it might, how it might bring up some tension for us as providers and sort of working through that uh, as well. Um, just other just important things I would like for this to be interactive. So again, as you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I'll be asking some polls and uh, this is really a shared learning experience. So we're here to really learn from each other and um, not, not as an expert learner, but a, a learner talk, but more of a, a shared learning environment. So I do wanna start with a poll and just kind of see um, where, um, where people are in terms of their, um, their comfort with um, reproductive justice. So if, um, if Amy, you could help to put on the first poll. Um, and it is, um, if you can answer yes or no, um, I am comfortable with and understand the reproductive justice framework. Just wanted to see where, where everyone is with talking about and their comfort with reproductive justice. It's live and going, and seems like it's hovering about two thirds are yes, and one third, maybe a quarter is no. Okay, okay, great. 
Yeah, and I, I didn't put it, I, I didn't leave any room for a, for maybe, but <laughs> but it sounds like it, uh, um, lots of folks in the room have um, have certainly heard heard about reproductive justice. Um, understand principles, have talked about principles, and maybe have started to incorporate pr the uh, practice into your work with young people. So I, I, lo I love that, again, having this sort of interactive discussion um, with, uh, with everyone. So I do want to sort of lay some sort of foundations and some ground um, shared understanding and, and definitions around um, re reproductive health and reproductive rights and reproductive justice. So we have all these words are kind of floating around and um, and uh, in more, more recent years, um, we, there have been more conversations about reproductive justice and the difference between health and rights. And so I think that that feels clearer, but just so we have a kind of a shared understanding um, and this came, came from a talk um, through Physicians for Reproductive Health and talking about perspective of reproductive justice. So when we think about reproductive health, we really think about the framework as more a service delivery model. So really providing health care, providing reproductive health care for people. It really is um, um, thinking about service delivery. And that can be also be like a holistic service delivery, but it's really the clinical services delivery model. Reproductive rights is um, a, a framework that is really based in, uh, in its purest form, legal and advocacy-based model, um, um, thinking about so protections of individuals and communities um, around the constitutional right to access reproductive health services and the right to actually have reproductive health services. Um, the um, the some of our reproductive health movement and the early women's movement around reproduction uh, protecting reproduction was really in this rights based framework, um, and uh, we often uh, hear that this um, can also be often be thought of um, benefiting middle class white women around, the, around rights a rights based framework. Um, uh, and uh, was really part of kind of the women's movement. Um, and so when we think about reproductive justice, it really is an expansion um, of the reproductive rights framework that is the, to be holistic and is movement, uh, movement building and uh, really looking at anytime there's reproductive oppression. So anytime someone's rights are taken away or um, holistic rights, any, anything that has to do with reproductive oppression is really a result of the, the multiple intersections of oppressions that, that people experience or multiple vulnerabilities that people experience that, um, that do not allow them to access their, uh, their full reproductive autonomy and reproductive ability. And so in that movement building, we really need to be addressing those multiple systemic oppressions and vulnerabilities that, um, that hinder um, people from being able to actually access those rights and not just purely the purely rights framework we're really looking at from this holistic perspective. So as far as the reproductive justice terminology and um, which became uh, the reproductive justice movement, this term was really coined in 1994. And maybe, uh, people might know about this. Um, 12 black women in Illinois um, got together in 1994, inspired by a, uh, a co the conference on uh, population and development, international conference on population and development in Cairo, Egypt, um, really looking at um, the reproductive rights framework and, and looking at to re reframe that framework to be uh, inclusive of a, a critical social context and really looking at it from a social justice per perspective. And again, looking at intersectionality. So intersectionality, again, is an, a, a, a term that's coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a scholar out of UCLA, and really looking at the, um, the intersections of vulnerabilities that um, that people have that make them that compound their vulnerability. So if we're looking at a example of um, a being um, a black individual, being a black woman in in this country is already a vulnerability. But and being unsheltered is a vulnerability, and um, being unemployed is also a vulnerability. So a black woman who's un unsheltered and unemployed now has these compounded vulnerabilities that even that um, that. Um, can threaten her, uh, her, her being able to actualize her reproductive rights and reproductive ability. And it really is a, a human, human rights framework. So yes, founded by women of color, but also looking at supporting 
um, uh, supporting uh, Black, Indigenous, uh, Asian communities, and also um, the, tr the trans community. So again, reproductive justice is this combination of reproductive rights and social justice. So really looking at reproductive rights in a social justice framework, um, looking at the, the vulnerabilities and uh, that, that disallow individuals from actually actualizing those rights. Um, reproductive justice has core principles. So we think about the core principles of reproductive justice um, and people might also know this, these four tenets, um, which is the right to have a child, the right not to have a child, the right to parent in safe and healthy communities. And the fourth tenant that we don't talk about so much, but it is a core tenant of reproductive justice is the right to dissociate sex from reproduction. So really talking about sexual pleasure and um, um, having, having sex that is not in any way connected with reproduction. Those are the four core principles of reproductive justice. And to be able to actualize those core principles, um, we, uh, it, 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 we really need to and um, look at it from a social justice perspective and um, really target it from a social justice framework. So what do I mean by that? So I mean that when we look at social justice, we're looking at equitable health services, equitable and, um, and affordable and high quality health services. We're thinking about bodily autonomy. We're looking at access thinking about anti-discrimination. So being able to access services that are not discriminatory, having uh, for, for individuals to have sufficient economic resources to then actualize their reproductive autonomy. And then social equity at up top, which is a really big one. It, it really is a quality affordable education, um, qual high quality um, uh, medical services, uh, land ownership, environmental justice, um, freedom from police brutality, freedom from the stress of racial discrimination. So really the, all of the, the, uh, the things that can challenge an individual from accessing their reproductive health. If you think about um, uh, young people that you work with and some of the challenges that young people have with being able to use contraception if they want to use contraception or being able to use condoms if their intention was, was to use condoms and um, they're, but they're still unable to actualize those intentions. Well, what is that from? We also, we often see that they, maybe that young person hasn't eaten to that day or maybe that young person doesn't have a place to stay or maybe the young person is having family conflict. All of those things impact um, that young person being able to actualize their reproductive autonomy. And that is what we think what we talk about with reproductive justice. Those are the things that we are targeting. Those are the things that we are working on um, dismantling around in reproductive justice. So this is really oops, this is really a human rights framework. And that was something that was very intentional by the, the founders of the reproductive justice movement. So when we think about so leadership, so I want to just pay um, um, respect and homage to the leaders of the reproductive justice movement. And one of them is Loretta Ross. And if you've heard, heard or read anything about reproductive justice, her name um, comes up time and time again. She is one, was one of those 12 founders of the reproductive justice movement. She also is the co-founder of Sister Song, which is our, um, our current uh, reproductive justice organization um, um, out of Atlanta. It uh, started in 1997 um, to, um, to really look at and um, start doing grassroots work on reproductive justice, started by women of color, um, African-American, uh, Latinx, uh, uh, Asian-American, and, um, and uh, gender expansive uh, LGBTQ women of, of color. So we know that reproductive justice movement was started by women of color, but reproductive justice is really for everyone. So whenever I give a talk about, um, about disparities around justice, around health equity, um, although um, some of those movements may have been born from a particular cultural group, it, everyone really benefits. It really is for everyone. And so with looking at reproductive justice, reproductive justice from a human rights framework, we know that um, in dismantling um, racist, 
um, classist and um, uh, and, and, and gender um, prejudicial laws really benefits the entire community and it benefits all of us. So I wanna ask another poll. So now that we've talked a little bit about reproductive justice principles, um, how many of you are really seeing reproductive justice principles applied in your work with adolescent patients and clients? And so Amy, you can put this poll up. I think that you're doing that. Yep, it's up and people are responding. Wow, almost, oh, well, it keeps shifting, I guess. <laughs> and for a second, it looked like almost everyone with a yes, but now it's, it's shifting a little bit. And I realized that I should have left some room for some nuance here, maybe put a maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, it does seem pretty similar to the last one, hovering around two thirds at yes and one third at no. Great, awesome, awesome. Yeah. So we have some, some um, train the trainers here, some leaders here that we can continue to apply the reproductive justice framework with um, um, other adolescent um, organizations and, and, and adolescent services. So that's awesome. I love, to, I love to hear that and see that. And we'll talk about how those are done specifically. So we, um, so it looks like with this group, you are, are seeing that in, um, in your service delivery. But we also know that there can often be tension in applying reproductive justice principles to um, adolescent healthcare. So I'm, um, if you have experienced tension around um, applying reproductive justice principles, um, particularly around bodily autonomy, um, around access, around um, young people being able to um, make independent decisions that we may not necessarily agree with <laughs> about um, uh, sexual behaviors or um, things that they, they'd like to do. Um, why do we think that the framework may not be applied to adolescent reproductive health care? Why, why, why might this tension exist? And if folks just want to write some things in the chat, I'll just leave like one, one minute for, for that. So if anyone's experienced any tension or around um, implementing reproductive justice principles or reproductive justice framework or have heard of these things, why, why do we sometimes see this in uh, adolescent reproductive health care? So as you all are putting those in, I'll, just, I'll keep going here. So, um, so some of the tension um, can be around how we talk about reproductive health with young people and um, where, our, where our principles, uh, the foundations of our principles for uh, reproductive health care. So we know that the early, um, early ideas and early origins of adolescent reproductive health care were really centered around teen pregnancy prevention. So much was around preventing becoming pregnant. Um, and this really um, often vilified adolescent mothers. So a, a, sp a strictly prevention framework without a, without a um, uh, side by side uh, supportive framework really vilified adolescent mothers. Adolescent mothers were called wayward girls, unwed mothers, teen mothers, even they use, even use the name teen mother um, can be used as code for to vilify adolescent mothers and then giving data around what would, what would happen to a young person if they became pregnant. And we can see some of the, the uh, information here on the right, on the left there. And that really from the 1950s, even to today, we, um, a lot of our um, discussions around motherhood, young motherhood is around pre prevention 
and money really being um, utilized for prevention, but not as much resources and many resources really going to support young mothers and support families. Uh, we know that this the uh, a pure a purely teen pregnancy prevention framework threatens adolescent reproductive justice. Um, it is making a choice for a young person for what their intention should be for their life. Um, we uh, the the it was the framework we were very these messages were very successful in uh, withholding support from young women if they became pregnant. So it was really mostly around again. Um, pregnancy prevention. Um, there was lots of propaganda around um, the, uh, the effects and risks and what would happen with a young mom, a mother if she were to give birth as a young person. Often coded languages, language was used um, uh, to uh, talk about young women of color and young, young mothers of color, teen mom, mothers of color um, in this same framework. Another um, sort of expanding on that, when we think about sort of contraceptive access, which has really been a great tool for young people being able to actualize their reproductive freedom, um, but it also was centered around teen pregnancy prevention. So again, we're choosing the option for a young person. So it's a great thing that we're providing access to contraception, but that access should be um, really couched in what a young person wants. And those early messages, again, were centered around teen pregnancy prevention. So the, 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 um, uh, in, the implementation of Title X clinics, which have been amazing, and Title X funding, which has been um, really life-changing for young people being able to actualize um, the contraceptive access and minor consent laws, again, being able to actualize their, their reproductive access. But again, those things really being steeped in teen pregnancy prevention. So again, still choosing that outcome for young people. Um, a, a, another um, example is also where our adolescent sexual health education comes from. Is it gonna be comprehensive education? Is it gonna be abstinence only education? What are we actually talking about and how does that change? Um, those fluctuate, fluctuating priorities being dependent on um, government administration and really be able to, to decide how we're going to talk to young people about their sexual health and reproductive health. Um, sending these really confusing, conflicting messages to you, depending on um, which type of curriculum is now um, going to be utilized and also not including the impact of structural inequities on sexual health. So again, not incorporating the social justice framework into health education and not providing the full uh, information to young people. Again, with this focus on teen pregnancy prevention. Um, also how we talk to young people about um, reproduction. So using um, particular types of counseling methods, like purely tiered based counseling, counseling methods that, um, that focus on high efficacy based um, methods to optimize pregnancy prevention. So again, we hear that word again, pregnancy prevention, without taking into, con uh, into account um, young people's preferences or having um, a full holistic conversation with a young person about what they want from their birth control method, but using a, uh, a purely tier-based counseling method to talk to young folks really focused on prevention. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this. Um, so we know that reproductive justice matters to young people. Um, and how do we know that? We wanna hear directly from young people. So I wanna, I wanna take a little time to bring youth voice into, into this talk as we can. So um, many of you might be familiar with Advocates for Youth and their, their wonderful advocacy work and um, positive, positive youth development work with young people. Um, they have a re reproductive justice um, um, coalition that really looks at um, young people talking about reproductive justice and what, how it's important to them. So I'll just read um, one thing here. So access to reproductive health is non-negotiable and must include both family planning and abortion care. As young people, we refuse to work with anyone who bargains away our rights to bodily autonomy and ultimately to our health. And they also talk about working at the intersection. So this social justice intersectionality that we've been talking about, 
the young people know and know that the fight for reproductive, reproductive and sexual health, right, health rights and justice includes fighting for an end to racism and structural oppression. So again, looking at that, how intersectionality directly um, uh, impacts reproductive health and reproductive rights. And then also, again, how racial justice and intersectionality really um, uh, impacting reproductive access, health, and rights. Um, and then we, I want a little bit of data from a study that um, I conducted, my, my graduate student, my medical student, graduate student, and I conducted together uh, a few years ago where we talked to young people who were being affected by um, sex trafficking about health services and about reproductive health and about reproductive justice. And we did qualitative interviews with these young people. And so I wanna share, share some of the quotes that they, um, they came back with us. And these are young folks in Oakland. So in talking about health system equity, this young person says, well, is our reproductive system equal? No, it's not. Because I think, I feel like if you go where money is, you can decide on what you wanna do. Like if you can't have a baby, but you've got money, they like try to make you have a baby. Like you feel, like you feel me? So again, this young person, um, not, not using the term of reproductive justice, but it also is, um, understands and sees how some people are treated differently based on accessing resources. And this, this young person, another young person when talking about abortion access and, uh, and poverty and how that connects with poverty. Youth want free access to reproductive health care can't afford it, but I think it's like abortions and how some people can't afford abortions and why they can't afford them. The P word, yeah, poverty. So again, young people see it. Young people understand that there are these differences and they understand that the differences are these social inequities and social um, challenges that are now allowing them to access these, their, their rights, their reproductive rights. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip this poll in sake of time. So I want us to talk a little about how to center reproductive justice for adolescents. Knowing that we all um, think this is important and we're already doing this in our, in our practices. So I wanna think about sort of what you all are doing. So what does RJ mean for us as providers? So I want you all just kind of reflect on this. So what is, what is this and how, how does this approach make us uncomfortable? How might this make us uncomfortable, especially thinking about the example I use around teen pregnancy prevention. And if we're you know, going away from these prevention models, how does that make us uncomfortable as, as providers working with young people who have vulnerabilities, who also might be um, wanting to make different decisions about the re reproductive health and what we would think are the healthiest choices for them. And then how does this framework alter um, how we would do our work? So if you, if you folks can just sort of reflect on that as you, um, as you look at these other, these next slides. So how do we prioritize reproductive justice when providing reproductive health care for young people? So really it goes beyond reproductive choice and reproductive rights, we've talked about that. We really wanna implore a positive youth development framework. So we talk about positive youth development in so many other areas of youth work and um, folks who are health educators and youth workers. And we, <coughs> we always talk, we talk often about positive youth development, but it's not something we talk about so much in the healthcare environment and really as healthcare pro as providers and uh, those who are providing healthcare directly to young people. But we also wanna implore that positive youth development framework. And we'll talk about that. Really youth have autonomy over their lives. And as providers, we are the facilitators, but youth are the drivers of their lives. We wanna ask youth what they want. We wanna assess what they need. And we wanna to listen to them and let them, and, and let them really take the lead. So how do we do that? So imploring this positive youth development framework, it really focuses on building positive outcomes. And those outcomes are outcomes that young people have identified, not that we have identified for them or not that we think would make a, a better life outcome for them. It really has to come from the young person. So youth voice and youth engagement is key. This is a long-term strategy. This is not something that's short. This is not something so that we can sort of sit in, sit in our in the um, clinic rooms or in our healthcare spaces and um, and 
and think that we are uh, going to have the answers or come up with the answers. It's really sort of long-term engagement involved with, me, with young people. Other strategies is thinking about how we talk to young people about contraceptive counseling, about contraception, if young folks are wanting contraception. Um, so moving away from this purely tier-based model of counseling into a shared decision-making model of counseling. And I won't get into the details of that because I think actually think that we had another talk around that um, in this conference, but really looking at this collaborative approach that, that engages young people and talks about their preferences for their lives and their, and, and their preferences for their method. And then choosing a method, helping a young person to, for them to choose their method based on their preferences and not based on um, what we feel like might be important for them. And then the other piece of this is bringing in the social justice piece and providing the comprehensive reproductive health care services, which includes a, a social justice perspective and social services. So again, high quality services that are gender inclusive, that are non-discriminatory, that incorporate social support. So that means housing, we have to look at housing and transportation and employment, education, social services. How are we, how are we um, supporting young people in actualizing their reproductive rights? It's not just about access, but how can they actually be able to actualize those things? Linguistic e equity, how are we, how are we um, supporting that? So really making this whole uh, holistic services that are, that are youth led. I want to give an example of something that we're doing in our clinic um, with our young mothers group. And this really happens organically um, and um, sort of came from our mothers. We started this group uh, about two years ago, and it was really because we had um, several young people coming to our clinic who were pregnant and were going to be having their prenatal care services with us. And we decided that we wanted to create a group for young people to get to know each other and also be able to support each other and so that we could support young folks as well. So we started this group called Young Mothers Rising. It's a, um, a weekly parents parenting support group for young people who are either pregnant, parenting, or planning to become pregnant. So that planning piece is something that we also noticed it was a gap. And we're not, we're not actually engaging young folks who are also planning. So it provides health education for young folks. Um, community speakers, um, the, the peer community that young people have been able to create has been the, the most important thing for young people. Having, having knowing another young person who is, ha has children or is pregnant during the same time to be able to lean on those young folks. Also be able to provide resources. So this is that the social justice piece. So we created a diaper program to support young people and be able to with resources and formula if they if they're using formula. Um, we have we create a baby clothes closet where young people can come and and, um, and get clothes for their children if they need it. We also recently this summer created a community fund to be able to support with some of the outstanding um bills that young people might have that they that they um that take away from being able to care for their child so if they had um and we and we chose um specific specific things that young people were being challenged by that we could then support um, we also have transportation support the other piece around this, so during COVID, we, we moved to an all virtual platform, which actually has um, opened up services for our young mothers group. We actually have young people um, throughout sort of our region now who are joining this group. Um, we have a health navigator that helps to co-lead the group and our navigator really provides individualized support for young people, um, social services navigation, this employment, education, all the things that we were talking about with reproductive justice in a consistent and ongoing way. Um, they, this on the left, you see a, a, a post that um, our, our, our co-facilitators send um, bi-weekly to, um, to our, our young mothers, showing just with different tips around their health, around health for their children, around pregnancy and parenting. And so really be able to provide, I guess, the, again, this ongoing support for, for young people. So in summary, I just want to um, just leave with this um, 
Um, one of the, uh, this is from a um, Jenny Higgins, who is an OBGYN and scholar out of the University of Wisconsin, who does a lot of work on reproductive justice. And she says that one of the tenets of reproductive justice is recognizing that the main reproductive challenges facing young, young and poor women of color is not unintended pregnancy by itself, but rather socioeconomic and cultural inequalities that provide some people with easier access to self-determination and bodily autonomy than others. And I just feel like that is so um, poignant here and really thinking about what are the, um, the structural barriers that our young people are experiencing that are, that are that is making them, that's challenging them actualizing their reproductive autonomy and reproductive rights. And then just one of the sheroes in my life, uh, Audrey Lord, who says there's no such thing as a single issue, single issue struggle because we don't we don't live single issue lives, and that is so true here when we think about the that is the reproductive justice movement is really the intersections and integration of um, all of the challenges and vulnerabilities that, that um, individuals may experience. I wanna leave you with just some tools here, um, some resources and readings. Um, this is a paper up top that was written by um, some of our adolescent medicine colleagues around the country around, again, applying reproductive justice framework to contraceptive counseling specifically for young people. Um, the uh, two books uh, written by Loretta Ross and, and colleagues, um, also experts and um, pioneers in the reproductive justice movement. And then um, for, for those who are providing contraceptive services, um, particularly around LARC methods, IUD methods, implant methods that have had, um, that have had a, um, a complex history with um, in, in the United States around re reproductive justice, please um, check out this, um, this textbook if you are providing the service for adolescents. Um, written by um, adolescent medicine providers around the country, uh, myself and um, and other folks, Suzanne Goodman, who's also who also gave is giving a talk either today or yesterday on this. Um, uh, and this was written from a reproductive justice and gender inclusive framework, so uh, it has cases and it really can help to um, um, uh, implement these frameworks that we that we're talking about today. So thank you so much. If there's any questions. So Dr. Bates, that was amazing. So much great information. Um, there are a few specific questions already as well as an interesting chat uh, discussion happening. So I'll, I'll start with the questions. Um, someone said the data that from your research looks amazing and she's wondering, is it published or will it be published so that she can review it? Yeah, thanks so much for saying that. We're actually we are actually finishing the paper now, so it's in the, it's in its last revision, and we'll be um, submitting the paper in the next couple of weeks. So um, uh, I will I will maybe I'll send it out to the to the group when it's um, when it's the to the alliance they can send it out. That sounds perfect. Yeah. And then a question about the Young Mothers Rising group specifically, which is our doula and midwife services available to them for labor support. Oh yeah, so so um, a, a few of our guest speakers have actually become more like guest partners, <laughs> and they um, one has been a lactation consultant that works um, um, directly in, in our safety net hospital where a lot of our young people go to deliver, and we've uh, we have met with the midwifery departments um, at our safety net hospital, Alameda Health Systems. Um, around um, making those connections. And uh, we recently have been working with the Black Birthing Justice Project for doula support, specifically for our young mothers. So actually they've come and done a focus group with our young moms and are providing ongoing supportive services for them as well. Awesome, that's amazing. Um, and then in the chat, there's just an interesting um, conversation happening. The, in response, I think, to your original question, people were talking about some of the barriers being balancing the quote-unquote goals, for example, teen pregnancy prevention with the organizational school ideas about how those goals need to be achieved and the lack of comfort with student-centered decision-making. Mm -hmm. um, they were saying that goals often come from the funding streams rather than from the youth themselves. Yes, yes, yeah, and that, 
it is it is a, a difficult balance. And as someone who's been writing um, grant proposals <laughs> lately, <laughs> um, yeah. something that we've been uh, really intentional about is um, putting in language around youth, youth led, um, that our services are youth led and that our programs will be youth led and, um, and what that means. And so that we'll be taking direction from young people and, um, and be able to provide um, resources and um, the, the support that, that, um, that actually recommends youth led services. So um, drawing on your, um, your references and uh, as, as much as possible. And actually the, the group um, that was, that I showed for positive youth development is out of Cornell. And they actually have a really, really great training module that all of my staff are doing now on positive youth development. And there are so many um, resources that, that, that they, I have actually used in proposals that to support this framework. We know it's a framework that works. We know that if young people uh, are making their choices about their reproductive health or really about anything, they are more likely to continue with those choices, to continue those things and to be able to actualize the intention behind the choice rather than if we choose for them. That's great. Yeah, but it is there is tension there. Um. Our friend Nova, also previously from Native American Health Center, said that in youth serving clinics, it can be difficult to separate sex for pleasure from reproduction because we are often coming from a lens that views adolescence as a risk factor for unplanned pregnancy. That's right. Yes. Which is why we have been sh also shifting to instead of, and we talk about the HEADS assessment, which we all use in adolescent medicine, which is really kind of our risk, a psychosocial risk assessment, um, to moving to the S HEADS assessment, which is a strength based assessment. So it's really looking at young, pers young person's um, strengths. And as, and as opposed to risks and not even using the word risk, but looking at their strengths and drawing on those strengths. Um, the other thing that we talk a lot about is sexual readiness. So before we even talk about sexual behaviors, even though we know the young folks are engaging in sexual behaviors, but as providers, having a conversation with them about sexual readiness and sexual consent. Because if you can open up a conversation around sexual readiness, then you can talk about sexual pleasure. Like what is, what's the, what are, what are their thoughts around the purpose of sex? So again, engage in like, what do you think you'd be having sex for? Is it for play, you know, is it for pleasure? And, and I think that we, and all, all of us who work with young people, um, you know, I'm, 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 off, I'm also, I'm often um, surprised by how many young people are um, having sex and not um, feeling pleasure. Or, or expecting for it not to feel pleasurable most of the time and are still doing it. And I think that there's a real gap in us talking to young people about sexual pleasure and the importance of that um, in their reproductive, in their, in their sexual decision-making. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Kayla from Missing Child Access Health was reinforcing that and saying, there seems to be a lot of fear that if we give youth too much information and too many choices, then they will make choices that we as the adults don't want them to make. So that's sort of paternalistic. That's right, right, exactly. Which is um, completely like the antithesis of a youth, positive youth development framework, but it's the framework that we all have been trained under. So we are so we are having to um, retrain ourselves um, to um, realize that young people are autonomous, and you know it's really interesting. There's there are so many conflicting messages around young people's autonomy because when we if we look at our minor consent laws, where we've given young people have the autonomy to access contraceptive services. In some states, they have the autonomy to access abortion services on their own. In some states, they can access pregnancy services. So we're giving them autonomy to do that, but we're not giving them autonomy to make decisions about what type of contraception they want. It's very confusing, right? And, and we also, we know that, you know, in the stages of adolescent development, this is the time where young people should be making independent choices with guidance. So adult guidance, but youth leadership. 
So again, where we always talk about youth led, adult guided, adults are facilitators. We're here to sort of talk to young people about, about their choices, but they are there to make their choices. Um, yeah, sort of piggybacking on that, um, Naomi Shapiro, who many of us know as well, said that um, even for those of us who think we're applying a reproductive justice framework, it's really important to reflect on the extent to which pregnancy prevention permeates all of our thinking and approaches. So she was saying thank yes. you for this workshop. Yes, thank you. Hi, Naomi. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Total, I totally agree. I mean, really, uh, pregnancy prevention has is really at the is really at the forefront of of the um, the access to the services that so many adolescents have received. It has been under the umbrella of preventing pregnancy. It has not been under the umbrella of young people making choices about their reproductive health. And, um, and us being open to the choices that they make. Um, and to add to um, what Naomi um, said and I, that I completely agree with is um, the other piece around reproductive justice is being able to bring in all these other social supports that we know that young people need to be able to actually actualize their reproductive rights. If young folks are uh, experiencing challenges around food insecurity or shelter or, um, or, or relation, compromised relationships, they can't fully actualize or engage in their reproductive autonomy. So we have to incorporate addressing those things at a, as a holistic model for providing reproductive health care. That's a great point. Um, Naomi actually also asked for an example. Could you give us an example as to how you would open a discussion with a young person about pregnancy, parenting, and contraception from a youth-centered standpoint? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I've, I've had this discussion a lot with my young, with young folks um, because we we really we really try and implore a youth-led, youth positive development model with our counseling, and and I still hold tension <laughs> in that. So I want I want to just name that that it's it, although that I'm committed to that, it's not easy. Um, and I've had young people who um, have come to me to have conversations about wanting to become pregnant. So the planning piece, which is why we added planning to our young mothers group, because we had so many young people who were planning, and. Um, and something I would ask, I would, I would talk to them about is I would affirm that they are, have made this, that they are thinking about this decision. So affirming that and asking them, what are some things that they have thought about in planning for pregnancy? What are some things that are important to them? What are some things that they want to have in place to be ready for, um, for having a child? And how do they, um, um, how would they describe or how do they feel about the, um, the, the person that they are planning to have a pregnancy with? Um, not everyone um, considers the person that they are planning to be pregnant with as a partner. So I don't wanna use words that a young person might not use, but I wanna know, I, I want to engage them in a conversation around um, what that connection is like. So it really, again, it is a slow process. And I was um, really grateful to um, this group out of Cornell, um, Act for Youth, um, that um, really took us through this positive youth development training around this slow process of really talking to and engaging young people around their choices. And some young folks got to, in my, in my uh, practice, some young people got to a point where they actually changed their minds. They're like, oh, actually, I'm not, I don't think I really want to do this right now with this person, or I feel like I want to be in school, I want to, I want to finish school or I want to finish work. And then some, some, some young people decided they wanted to continue on this path. And we were talking about the support. So that's the piece I felt like was really missing with our, with this pure teen pregnancy prevention model is that it really took away support from young mothers and support from um, young people who may be thinking about and planning a pregnancy. That's awesome. And I'm just posting that resource in the chat right now. Um, we had an, another comment about that the conversation um, often turn, can be shifted to suit legislators and their views. For example, currently during the um, 
sorry, I just had to chat that and lost it. Oh, during this federal re Republican uh, legislature, the cost of unplanned pregnancy is being lifted up. And so the messaging is centered around the risks and cost of society rather than the rights of young people. Yes, yes, which also, and it, it, is, it, is, a it is a strategy that is that it's used uh, politically, and also it's um, also used by local governments. It's also used by health health insurance plans. It's also used by federal implant plans, um, and it's also very narrow. So it, when we sort of look at that cost, and actually there was a, a graphic that I had that was from a group out of Texas that also would do, was doing some legislation around the cost of unplanned pregnancy, and what they also looked at was um, the um, the cost of, of Medicaid and the cost of WIC um, and the cost of that would happen when, um, when young people don't finish school and the cost of them not going to college. All these social, social things um, that without actually addressing the social inequities. So I, I, I wonder, I wonder if we can imagine what could be shifted if we, um, provide support and funding for supporting those social services and those social supports, would we still see those same deficits in, um, in funding and in, 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 so even some were even looking at revenue. Would we, see, would we see those same deficits if we're actually supporting young people in their decision-making as opposed to um, watching young people sort of flounder and then looking at um, how it affects the, the bottom line. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, all of the rest of the comments are just gratitude to you for the day and for your presentation and for your amazing work. Thanks so much. Thank you to yeah. everyone. I, thank you. So I've learned so much from, uh, I was in the conference yesterday. I learned so much from uh, this conference. And I think it's, 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 been, it's been really great. And, always good to be with other um, youth providers as well. <laughs> well, thank you so much to you, Dr. Mays, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, please stick around for the second wave of workshops this afternoon, and then also the closing plenary where um, Tracy sort of summarizes the state of school-based health centers in California. So thank you all for your time today, and thank you for the work that you do with young people. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Amy.